Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you're here with us today and you've joined us for worship this morning. Um, just a quick reminder to those of you who are here in the sanctuary this morning of just a few um, important things, important requests that we have while we're in the building this morning. There will be uh, no congregational singing at this time. We'd ask that instead you would just sit back and enjoy the music that's been uh, prepared for you this morning. Um, and we have a great honor this morning to have a guest praise team uh, leading us this morning. Uh, some members of our, our, our long-standing choir here at, at the church. And so we're very excited to sing for you this morning. Just sit back and enjoy. Um, we do want to uh, ask you to observe social distancing while you're in the building at all times. Um, and if you would like to have a conversation with one another, we ask that you just don't gather in the Welcome Center. Uh, please uh, go to the Beacon Room after worship, and, and there'll be coffee and water, and you can certainly uh, gather socially distant there um, and have conversation together. If you are joining us online today, we want to say welcome to you as well. We encourage you to communicate uh, together with us and with one another uh, throughout this worship service. Uh, we ask you to certainly use the uh, comments feed that's on this video uh, to communicate with us. You can also uh, send us a private uh, Facebook message. Uh, that private Facebook message would then be relayed to us and we can respond. Or uh, you can certainly email us at the faithful60108 at gmail.com. With that, would you join me in prayer this morning as we uh, prepare for our time of worship this morning? Father, thank you so much for gathering us here in your house this morning, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to gather and sing your praise. Lord, it is just a beautiful day outside. The sun is shining for the breeze is keeping us cool, and we thank you, Lord, that you've showed us yet again that you continue to be in control of all things. Father, this morning, uh, we come from lots of different places in our lives. We come from roads that are broken and roads that are difficult this week. We come from roads that are full of joys and praises. Wherever we come from today, Lord, we pray that you bring us all together in this place. Whether we're here in person or joining together online, that you would remove all those distractions from our hearts and that you would show us your face clearly this morning. Father, we uh, ask now for the wisdom, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place as we worship and sing your praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Psalm 77, verses 14 through 15. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is His great is our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. With your mighty arm, you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Oh, yeah. 
in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and behold your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Oh, my God. 
Understand and believe that your love will not ever let us go. That you have loved us in such a powerful way. That you have given us such an incredible gift in your Son, Jesus Christ. That you have promised us in such an amazing way life eternal with you. Father, if you're throwing paths, you have been there with us. Even though the way seems like it leads to a dreadful end, you have shown us that you are still our God. And you are there at last for us. Father, what a joy it is to know this great truth this morning, to, to be still and know that you are God for us. We thank you this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, we come to the time of our worship service this morning where we uh, have just a few uh, items of family business to share together this morning. The first is, um, I would love, if, especially those people who are here in person, but those of you who are, are, are watching via Facebook as well, could just uh, shout, give up a shout of praise the Lord this morning for these folks who have been willing to get out of their comfort zone, stand up here and lead you all in worship this morning. Let's just give a shout of praise the Lord. It's, um, they will tell you it's not as easy as it looks, right? <laughs> it has been super fun putting that all together and uh, what a joy it's been. Um, we have just a couple of quick announcements to share with you guys this morning. Our next outdoor worship service is coming up uh, Sunday, September 6th. Uh, it will begin at 10 a.m. Uh, we will begin with our outdoor worship gathering. And then we'll follow it up with a social distance uh, picnic. Uh, what is a social distance picnic? Well, basically, it's a, a really good old-fashioned picnic uh, that we don't sit next to each other. So um, we'd love to have you come and participate with us. You don't need to bring anything other than your own chair. Um, we will provide everything else. Uh, we're going to have uh, pulled pork and brats and uh, chips and cookies. Um, if you are a fan of our traditional uh, pulled pork with the cherry barbecue sauce, this is your opportunity to get some. Um, we're going to have it for this event, and we will have extra sauce and other things for you to, to uh, make a donation to the church and, and uh, take some home with you. So we'd love to have you join us for this event that's uh, Sunday, September 6th, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, also, our Saturday morning uh, men's and women's Bible study has now resumed, and there is still time for you to join us. There's always time for you to join us. You're never too late. Uh, we meet on the second and fourth Saturdays of each month, beginning at 8.30 a.m., and we are working our way through the book of Joshua, We're just in Joshua chapter 2 this next time on the 22nd. I would love to have you join us for that. And of course, we have Big Week Study as well every Thursday at noon, uh, both live and in person here and via Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to participate in that, please just let us know that you're coming or uh, let us know and we can send you the Zoom information uh, for that Big Week Study. Um, one other just quick announcement that I would share is that um, I mean, I'm sure most all of you have heard uh, and see all of the different reports and things that are coming out about some of the ways that uh, Illinois is changing some of the mandates about uh, face masks and other kinds of things. Uh, I want you to know that your church council is uh, is taking all of that um, in consideration. Uh, the church council has a meeting scheduled for tomorrow night anyways, and so we're going to be talking a little bit about um, if or how um, we might need to adjust some things as a result of that. Um, that's not a big scare tactic or anything. It's just I want you to know we've heard all of that and we are intending to talk about it uh, tomorrow evening. Um, I don't know what the results will be of that, but um, the, the changes are not significant, but there have been just a, a few minor changes. So be praying for the church council as we gather together tomorrow night. And, uh, um, you know, it's for those of you who have ever served on council, it's always kind of difficult. There's difficult decisions that have to be made for every council, but 
I have to say, uh, this has been a particularly difficult go for the folks who are serving on council, filled with uh, never before expected decisions that have to make. And so uh, we just ask for your continued uh, prayers over us. And given all of that, we will be making uh, kind of a, just an update with any changes available to our congregation as soon as we can. Again, I'm not expecting anything significant. I just want you to know that we are taking it under consideration and we will be talking about that tomorrow. Um, there are also, uh, there is a prayer list uh, provided for you in your bulletin this morning. If you're here in house, if you're uh, joining us online and you have uh, subscribed to our um, midweek uh, uh, beacon mailing, you will receive that virtual um, bulletin tomorrow morning. I ask you to be praying for all of these folks that are listed in the bulletin. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly there are other requests um, that have not been listed here, that came into us immediately after the time of printing or things that have happened over the weekend. Uh, be praying for all of these uh, over, uh, over this next week. And uh, we ask for your continued prayers, especially for all of our teachers and students, um, as uh, many, many teachers have been working hard to prepare a sort of a hybrid model with some students in class and some students uh, virtually. Uh, and it seems like almost every district is now reverting back to a fully remote schedule for fall. And so uh, that's the kind of shifting things around for our teachers and our students yet again. Um, and so we just ask that you continue to pray for them as they try to figure, figure this all out in a new and different world for sure. Um, and of course, continue to pray for all of our firefighters, EMTs, policemen and women first responders uh, lifting up the Chicago Police Department because it seems like we can't get through a weekend without some kind of uh, catastrophic thing happening there. And so just a lot needs our prayer. So this morning, would you join me as we bring all of this to the Lord in prayer? Father God, um, it has been a, a great honor to worship you this morning. Father, in the Psalms, King David reminded us that this is the day that the Lord has made, not any other day. We're in this moment with you, and yes, you made yesterday, and yes, you made tomorrow, but we are right here in this moment with you today. And what we're called to do on this very day that you have made for us is to rejoice. Rejoice that you would love us so that you would see fit to give us this day. And so, Father, we begin this morning by giving you thanks and praise to you for all that you are, for all that you have been to us, all that you have promised that you will be for us in the future. Father, there are some in our congregation who are experiencing some of life's most difficult transitions. Some are um, selling long, long lived in homes and, and moving to new places. Some are retiring. Some are uh, experiencing the birth of, an, of a child. Some are uh, in the throes of, of the difficulty of not being able to conceive a child. Uh, others are experiencing marital struggles and, and other relationship issues. And some are experiencing divorce and some are getting ready to be married. And Father, there are just a myriad of moments in the lives of this church. And Lord, we lift them all up to you this morning. We ask that you continue to be God over all of these things. Father, we ask that you would continue to help us follow you. That each day we would understand a little bit more about who you are, what you've done for us. That each day we would be drawn just a little bit closer to you and a little bit nearer to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and a little bit better follower of your Holy Spirit, our God. Father, we continue to pray for those who are sick, be it with COVID-19 or some other illness, be it with some kind of injury, recovering from surgery. Father, we ask that you would continue to strengthen your people. Give them strength day by day and courage to face the battle that lies ahead of them. Father, we pray for all of those who are grieving this morning, the loss of a loved one. This continues to be a very difficult time in which to lose someone, one in which we are not, in so many ways, allowed to celebrate as we once were 
the life of that person and the life that you gave them. Ways in which we're not able to come together to support these grieving brothers and sisters. We ask that you, in our absence, would give them an extra measure of your grace and your mercy. Father, we continue to lift up our nation before you. We remain, Father, in a very divided nation. We remain at a time, Father, where, where we experience protests and riots and looting and other kinds of things every day. We continue to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in blue that they would be protected as they protect us. We pray for all of our emergency responders, our firefighters, EMTs. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to protect them all. Father, we continue to pray for peace in this nation, for unity, not division. Father, we ask that you would continue to be with all of our teachers and all of our students as they prepare for this school year, unlike any other before, an uncharted adventure, if you will. Father, it is indeed going to be a difficult year. But we know this truth. You never said anything before us that you are not able to help us achieve. And so we just ask, Lord, for your help, your strength, your courage, for all of those teachers and students, for all of the workplaces that are having to change their way of doing things, for all of the people who are so radically impacted by this new way of life. And so, Father, as we begin, we end with praise. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We saw fit to be humble and obedient to your every word. And as a result, you gave to us the greatest gift that could ever possibly be given. The forgiveness of our sins. The privilege to stand right before you and the promise of eternal life. We give you this in his name and for his and your glory alone. All God's people say. Amen.
As we prepare to hear the word of God this morning, I would ask that uh, wherever you are this morning, you would stand uh, for the reading of God's word, giving God's word full authority uh, in our lives. This morning we read from Genesis chapter 20, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 30, uh, beginning at verse 25. May God add his blessing to our reading of this word for this day. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me on my way so I can go back to my own homeland. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and I will be on my way. You know how much work I've done for you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He added, name your wages, and I will pay them. Jacob said to him, you know how I've worked for you and how your livestock has fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now... When may I do something for my own household? What shall I give you? He asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages and my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on those wages, you have paid me. Any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted, any lamb that is dark, not dark colored will be considered stolen. Agreed, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. Now well, that same day, he removed all of the male goats that were streaked or spotted and all the speckled or spotted female goats, all of them that had white on them and all the dark colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white stripes on them, peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. And when the flocks were there and in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves but made the rest face the streaked and colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made a separate flock for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. 
Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. Well, this morning, I want to start with a question for husbands, all the husbands in the room. Have you ever found yourself, husbands, in a situation where you are perfectly clear what step you should take next? You've even become perfectly clear on how you should go about taking that next step. But all of a sudden you find, for the sake of your family, that you have to wait to move forward. You have to wait to take that next step until exactly, precisely the right moment. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I was just talking the other day to uh, someone about a, a concrete project that they had done at their home. And as it turned out, they had just recently completed that project, but their intent was that that project would be done uh, even a year ago. The husband had called the contractor, and he had received the quote, and he had even agreed to the scope of all that work. However, just as the work was uh, uh, getting ready to begin, the husband realized something. Now is not a good time for us to do this work. This isn't the right time to complete this work for our home. Uh, It's gotten way too late in the season for 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 this kind of work. And frankly, we really haven't been able to save up the kind of money we needed for this project. So we need to wait. Now, I'll bet that this contractor in that moment was not super happy with that husband's decision. But I have to give credit to the husband here because he stopped for just a moment. He he thought about this project, and though this project would be a great improvement to his family's home, it simply wasn't the right time to do it. Moving forward right now would put his family perhaps in financial bind or create an unstable environment for this new uh, addition to their home. Waiting, it seemed, was the best plan. Now, as we open chapter 30 today, the last part of chapter 30, we see Jacob in a very similar situation to this. Jacob knew full well what he desired. He wanted for his future flocks of his own, a home of his own, a family of his own. Jacob knew how to go about obtaining all of that. He and his He and his family were were not in need. He was figuring out how to get the things they needed. And Jacob had completed all of the work that was required of him in exchange for all of the things that he had. But there's a, a very simple fact that remains. The time was not yet quite right for Jacob and his family to move on to the to the next step of their family. Until, of course, that is, we open chapter 30 at verse 25. Until this very moment, it hadn't been right for Jacob to move forward. But in in Genesis 30, 25, we read, After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Now, send me on my way now so that I can go back to my homeland. What Jacob most needed, you see, was to be enabled to provide for his family. He wanted to provide what they needed most. What Jacob wanted most was to be on his own, out from under the control of Uncle Laban. You know, Uncle Laban had, he had everything Jacob needed. And frankly, by the way, good old Uncle Laban had all that stuff because of all of the work that Jacob had done for him to grow the flocks. You know, some have said that perhaps Jacob grew the flocks of Laban by 10 or even 20 fold in his time working for Laban. You see, everything that Laban possessed was a result of Jacob's determination to fulfill his vow to Laban and to fulfill it and follow it well. And what 
Jacob desires right now is just to be free. To be afforded the opportunity to leave the household together with his family and his wives and his children and and just a few sheep and goats to help the family survive. But what old Uncle Laban is unwilling to lose here is cheap labor. You see, if Jacob goes away, then so goes Laban's right-hand man. Not only does Laban lose his chief shepherd, but by the way, Jacob's going to take his daughters with, and who were caring for the sheep before Jacob miraculously came along? Oh, that's right, the daughters. You see, if Jacob leaves his father-in-law's home and he sets out on his own to set up his family, Laban loses a right hand. And by the way, Laban stands to lose absolutely everything he has. Everything that Jacob has worked so hard to provide for him. But for Jacob, if he leaves right now, taking his wives and his children and, and some sheep and some goats, he stands to gain the blessing of having his own home, his own family, his own life. But you see, until that moment, Genesis 30, 25, there was one thing that stood in Jacob's way. Guess what it was? Rachel. Rachel stood in his way. This woman he had so loved, the the woman that was so worthwhile for Jacob that he would indenture himself to to serve even seven more years. And the, the woman for whom he would marry another woman that he didn't love in order that he could finally get to Rachel. Until now, Rachel was the only thing that stood in Jacob's way of moving on with his life, his family, his home. Because you see, until this very moment, Rachel was barren. She hadn't given him any children. And it was a well-established practice amongst the Hebrews that when men would take wives and leave the, the household, if that wife remained barren to him, so often along the way, those wives would be discarded. And then, poor Rachel is out on her own. Nothing to provide for her, no one to provide for her. Laban would never let that happen to his daughter. And so Jacob had been stuck until this moment. The New International Version commentary on the Bible says this. It says, It is not coincidental that Jacob requests permission to take his leave of Laban only after Joseph is born. If a woman has not born children, she can easily be discarded or demoted. The only protection that she, being Rachel, had came from her father's family, who then took responsibility for her. You see, until Joseph, the twelfth of Jacob's thirteen children, was born, until he was born of a natural husband's will and and mother's will, if you will. Leaving Laban's household had been very, very risky for Jacob and for Rachel. And so knowing this, Laban would never have agreed to it, and Jacob would have been forced to violate trust with this father-in-law if he wanted to leave. But now, at Genesis 25, 30. Now, by the miraculous power of God, working on the part of Jacob and Rachel, Rachel has conceived Joseph, given birth to him. She has called him Joseph with eager anticipation in her heart because the name Joseph means may the Lord add. And so she was eagerly anticipating that the Lord would add more sons to her lineage And of course, Jacob was eagerly anticipating that the Lord would add to his land, his sheep, and his household. So the birth of Joseph gives Jacob the firepower that he actually needed in order to finally address Uncle Laban. Request what is rightfully his and set off to make this life of his own. And this is where our thesis for today comes into this message. The big picture point we're trying to make this morning. Jacob owes everything he has to God. 
Jacob owes everything he has to God. Everything. There is nothing that Jacob has. No wife, no child, no sheep, no goat, no house that God hasn't given to Jacob by his own hand, by his abundance, grace, and mercy. And so in the moments that come now for Jacob, we're going to see this precious truth start to unfold. Point one in our message today is this. Laban's deceptive heart has bad results for Jacob. It results in a bad deal for him. I began this message by talking to husbands and asking you to consider if you'd ever had a situation like Jacob finds himself in where the timing of the decision you're about to make is everything. It is so greatly important. The idea is wonderful. The plan is prepared. Everything seems to be in order, but there's just something about making that decision that tells you, you know, I got to wait. Jacob has had a pretty harried past of high moments and low moments, right? Jacob took it upon himself to deceive his brother Esau and steal that birthright for just a bowl of soup. And and together with his mother, Rebecca, Jacob uh, deceived his father, Isaac, and, and stole the blessing that was intended for Esau. Yet, when it came to winning Rachel as his wife, Jacob was patient. He paid the price. He waited for God to provide her. Yet still, Jacob was prone to taking matters into his own hands, wasn't he? And so he slept with not one, but two of his wives' maid servants in order to increase his lineage. But now we see Jacob once again ready to wait, waiting for exactly the right moment till all things have been placed in order before moving forward with the plan to build his life. In contrast to that, we see Uncle Laban this morning. His deeds continue down this treacherous path. He first deceived Jacob by uh, disguising his elder daughter for his younger and sitting idly by while Jacob consummated marriage with her. And then Laban lied to Jacob. He, you know, Jacob had asked for Rachel's hand in marriage as a payment for seven years of indentured labor. And Laban said, yeah, sure. But then it turned out to be more than 14 years. And Now Laban decides to deceive Jacob yet again. In Genesis 30, 31 through 36, we read these words this morning. Jacob replied, But if you do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark-colored lamb, every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages, and my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on those wages you paid me, any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted, any lamb that is not dark-colored will be considered stolen." Agreed, said Laban. Let it be as you have said. That same day he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted, all the speckled or spotted female goats, all that had white on them, all the dark-colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to uh, to, to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. So Laban's deceptive heart here had one thing in mind from the very outset of this whole thing. Jacob began to ask what was rightly his. He wanted to have the things that was due to him for nearly 20 years worth of labor. But but Laban's mindset is this. Do whatever it takes to make sure that Jacob either A, stays here, continues to work for my increase and the increase of my household, or B, if Jacob does decide to leave, that he leaves with nothing. Laban's deceptive heart results in this terrible deal for Jacob. And point two for today then says this, Jacob responds to Laban's bad deal with purposeful submission to God's powerful provision. Purposeful submission to God's powerful provision. Again, if we read in the NIV application commentary, it says this. Any shepherd knows that strong parents breed strong lambs and kids. Jacob, therefore, engages in common sense selective breeding 
as a means to produce strong and healthy offspring. The strategy is combined with a folk tradition that conditions during breeding, such as what the animals uh, are seeing in their visual field, may have an impact on the offspring. This principle has no genetic logic or verification. Whatever level of success Jacob enjoys while using this procedure is attributable only to God, regardless of the conclusions that Jacob might have drawn. And so God does not reveal to Jacob new and successful strategies. He merely brings him success despite his strategies. That is a powerful truth for us. God doesn't do something new, never seen before, some kind of great big miracle. He merely gives a miracle in the midst of these strategies that Jacob thought might be successful. God doesn't reveal to Jacob any crazy miracles or any never before heard of means of increasing his chances of having the flocks bear these strong yet speckled uh, uh, young. Instead, what God does here, what God has done so many times before, what God will do for us again in the future is this. God took Jacob's use of these worthless strategies, these powerless schemes, and he turned them into successful strategies for the benefit of his own child who he so desperately loves. Perhaps a a more simple way of saying that this morning is this. God took a terrible, hopeless mess and he made a monument out of it. God took a, a terrible, hopeless mess and he made a monument out of it. You know, God would bless Jacob with this strong herd of goats and sheep. And as it so happens... That would leave deceptive old Uncle Laban with a prettier but weaker herd. I don't believe that Jacob's motive here was to stick it to Laban. It's simple biology. When strong animals breed with other strong animals, they tend to produce other strong animals. When weaker animals breed with weaker animals, they produce weaker animals. And Jacob was just trying to establish a herd for himself. So, of course, He is going to strive for the strongest herd possible. And that does leave Laban with, well, I suppose what Laban actually deserved in the first place. You know, a flock that on the outside looks pretty and great, but on the inside is deceptively weak. It's fitting, isn't it, for Laban, a man who himself outwardly appears so strong, but has proven himself to be equally deceptive and weak. It seems to me that what we see Jacob doing here is responding to Laban's bad deal in this profoundly appropriate way. You see, the, never, the text never really tells us that Jacob really does submit to God in this instance, but we see submission here. Jacob has asked his uncle for nothing more than what he is owed, wives, children, and, and, and a few sheep, a herd. And so rightly, when Laban says, hey, listen, name your wage, stay here and work for me, tell me how much it'll cost me, and I will pay it to you, Jacob says, I don't want anything more than what I'm owed. Nothing else. Just give me what's rightfully mine, and then I will leave this household and I will make my own. Some might ask, how can Jacob be so confident? How can he know that if he leaves with just a few sheep in his family, he's going to be able to make it, create a household, uh, uh, make a life for them? We have to recall back in Genesis chapter 28 what God promised Jacob at the beginning of this thing. Chapter 28, beginning at verse 13, reads this way. I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. 
I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God promised Jacob, I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this place once more. I will not leave you until all these things have been done for you. I want to submit this to you this morning. As Jacob patiently waits for this old wives' tale about these poplar branches in the water uh, being able to change the speckled nature of his goats and his sheep, he hasn't placed his trust and his, and his hope in some kind of an old uh, fictional wives' tale. He has placed his hope, his trust in everything that God has told him. And he is resting and waiting and trusting that God will make good on his promise and that his, his promise will result in blessings abundant for Jacob. And so Jacob literally owes everything he has to God. By the way, so do you and I. So do you and I. There are many in this world who have that same heart as Laban, and they have it towards us. They may look and even sound like they have our best interests at heart, but our best interests can never lie in the heart of someone who wants to deceive us. Our best interests are always found in God's heart for us, the one who loves us, the one who has placed his arms around us. And so what about you this morning? Where is it that you have placed your trust this morning? Where have you placed your hope? Uh, is it in the things of this world? The wives' tales, the, the folk traditions, the superstitions? Or is it in the well-established, well-demonstrated, generous, compassionate love and power of God? Listen, if you're still hoping that this world, that someone in this world or something in this world will make all the difference for you, I have to caution you this morning because you probably have a very difficult lesson ahead of you in the future. Everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you will ever be is because God has made this promise with you, just like he did Jacob, I will not leave you until everything I have promised you has been fulfilled to you. So why would you look elsewhere? Why would you go to this world? Why not trust God? Point three for today is this, you know, what makes the greatest difference for Jacob and for us? It isn't the kind of miracle that God provides. Rather, it is the simple fact that we have a miracle providing God on our side. Some have suggested that it was merely biological intuition that won Jacob such a strong and large herd of livestock. Some have said that it was Jacob's great success in breeding speckled yet strong livestock because, well, this was just good old agricultural, this is how it works knowledge. To some extent, it's hard to argue with these statements. However, I want to go back for just one moment to the second paragraph from that NIV application comment we read. It said this, this principle, meaning the trick of putting the poplar twigs into the water, has no genetic logic or verification. Whatever level of success Jacob enjoys while using this procedure is attributable to only God regardless of the conclusions Jacob may have drawn. There is no genetic logic or verification, meaning farmers themselves, even scientists will agree that you can stick all the poplar twigs in the water you want. It ain't gonna make a difference. 
Speckled goats and black sheep don't have a tendency to produce strong offspring. End of story. That's how it works. So the commentary's point is valid here, and it's prudent to our third point. Whatever level of success that Jacob has and enjoys here is attributable only to God, regardless of what he might have thought about it. I am not sure what kind of conclusions this commentary suspects that Jacob might have drawn. Perhaps they think that Jacob thought, wow, it really worked. I put those twigs in there, and these goats bred strong, speckled goats. It worked. But when Jacob has a promise from God that says, I will not leave your side until everything I've promised you has happened for you, I don't think that's how Jacob responded. I think he said, wow, God, you did it. God, listen. I did whatever I could to try to make this unlikely situation at least the slightest bit possible. But now, wow, oh God, there it is. You took my last ditch effort and you made it look like a professional grade process. Maybe Jacob understood this last point for today and this most important point for today. It is never about the miracle. It is always about the one who makes those miracles possible. It is never about the kind of miracle God gives to you. It is about the fact that God is a miracle-giving God. You know, I've heard stories like this one, for example. There was a young mother racing home to prepare dinner for her husband, had all three of her kids in the car, a load of groceries, It was a difficult trip to the grocery store. Her children had been uh, just horribly misbehaved. As they made their way home that day, the woman's phone rang. It was her mother on the other end of the line. It sounded as if her mother had just suffered some kind of a stroke. And indeed she did. This mother had had a stroke, and she couldn't quite get the words out right, and the daughter remembered that. And so she listened more patiently on the other line as her mother said, listen, your dad left this morning without bringing in those tomatoes from the garden that I needed to make the BLT sandwiches tonight for dinner. And so I need you to come over to my house right now and get those tomatoes so that I can make the BLT sandwiches for dinner. The young mother, tired, frustrated, acquiesced to her mother's appeal, made her way back toward the grocery store that she had just left, putting her further and further away from home. They pulled into the driveway of her mother's house, and her youngest daughter decides to have an accident right there. They had been potty training, but this extra time had sort of been too much, and she just couldn't hold it anymore. And so the young mother escorted the children out of the car and into Grandma's house, and she quickly changed the wet daughter into clothes that were kept at Grandma's house just in case there was an overnight stay. And then she proceeded to the garden, and she got the precious tomatoes, and then she walked in the door, and she placed the tomatoes on her mother's counter, and she kissed her mother goodbye, and she collected her children, and they got back in the car, and she pointed the car toward home, and as they reached the parking lot that she had turned around in to go back to her mother's house, there just two blocks ahead of them was a catastrophic car accident. It appeared everybody was all right, but boy, the cars were smashed up. And just then it appears to this young mother, had she not gone back for those stupid tomatoes, that could have very well been them in the accident. Now the point is, maybe it would have been them or maybe it wouldn't have been them. We don't know. Either way, those stupid tomatoes 
may very well have just become one of God's minor miracles. The point of this is simple. Never pass off God's ability to use everyday situations in miraculous ways for your life. Never pass off God's ability to use everyday situations in miraculous ways for your life. You know, poplar trees are not likely to help goats and sheep bear stronger offspring. And stupid tomatoes don't seem like life-saving distractions. But then again, a simple carpenter from Nazareth didn't appear to be a likely candidate for savior of the world either. What makes the greatest difference for Jacob and for us is not the kind of miracle that God provides. It's the simple fact that we have a miracle providing God on our side. Laban's deceptive heart intended to make a bad situation for Jacob. Jacob, however, submitted that otherwise impossible situation to the one who has been promising he would be with Jacob wherever he would go. And so because of Jacob's submission to God's powerful promise for his life, Jacob saw everyday twigs become miracle-working herd multipliers. Because it's never about the miracle. It's always about the one who makes the miracles possible. Amen? Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we have many instances of schemes in our lives. Ideas Silly, yes, but things we build up in our hearts and in our minds that we're going to do to make our life better. And we lift up these ridiculous things like twigs and tomatoes. And Father, what continues to astound us is that you have this habit every day of our lives of turning those otherwise impossible situations into miracles for us, one way or another. Sometimes, yes, we have to learn something. Sometimes it's maybe painful. Sometimes it's hard for us to hear. Sometimes it's corrective that we would get back on the right track. And other times, you know, we loft it out there as if it's the last-ditch effort, and you use it as if it was the greatest thought-out plan ever. Father, we thank you for working a miracle in Jacob's life, providing for him, enlarging his home, his sheep, his family. And somewhat selfishly, Father, we pray for the same for us. We pray that you would love us that way, that we would be constantly aware that you do love us that way. That you have already loved us that way, that you are today loving us that way, and that tomorrow you're going to continue to love us that way because you have promised us, Father. You will not leave us until what you have promised us has been done for us. Father, we have hope in this promise. We trust this promise because we have hope and trust in you and you alone. We give you thanks for this good word this morning. And all God's people said, amen. In just a second, we're going we're gonna to sing a song for you um, that is uh, an old hymn, um, but it may be unfamiliar to many of you. Um, the title of it is Little is Much When God is in It. Uh, I probably don't have to explain the connection to the message, but I will give you this thought. Um, 
So many times we bring before the Lord what seems like a penny. And his great work for us is that he turns it into a million bucks before him. Doesn't matter how little it is, if you come before him with a fervent desire to serve him with whatever it is, he multiplies it. Jesus said that to the widow, right? Who gave her very last might, and he said, little is much because I am in it. So I encourage you to go and take those simple twigs. Go and take those stupid tomatoes and allow God to multiply them. Turn them into something powerful for your sake. And so go with the love of God our Father, with the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ his Son, and by the power and presence of his Holy Spirit this day, 
and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Praise God Thanks for being with us. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.